Well, good day. I was going to say good morning. It's morning where I am, but I don't know where you are and what time it is when you're listening to this, but you're back with me again for another week of awesome topic on the podcast. We are going to talk today about what I think are five very crucial lines of inquiry that we need to be taking with our patients. Now, you can ask all of these questions on an intake form, and they can answer the questions clearly. However, when there are questions that you can ask personally, like, you know, you're looking them in the eyeballs and you're asking a question about their health history, you often will get very different information than you would otherwise. Because even if you're on a Zoom call, the interaction one-on-one really does change the dynamic between the practitioner and the patient. And so when you can ask these questions, you can listen for little signs, little things that are like, "Mm, tell me a little bit more about that, right? Something along those lines that gives you reason to pause a bit and say, ah, I'm not sure about that. Tell me a little bit more about what's going on with that. That's kind of what I'm looking for here is how do we get out information from the patient that otherwise might be hidden? So here are the five, actually there's six because I added another one, but these have always kind of been my five big building blocks, so to speak, of creating kind of a patient history as I'm interrogating the patient. And again, even if you've asked these questions on your intake form, don't be afraid to ask them again in person because you will so often get a different answer. I don't think the patient's trying to lie. I think they just, you know, they're like filling out a form. They're doing a thing. They're doing a very different activity when they're just filling out your paperwork versus actually having a conversation with you. So my number one has been since I heard this from Carrie Bone, and that is the never been well since moment. And if you've been hanging around with me clinically for any amount of time, whether you're in clinical academy or you've been to some seminars, you know what NBWS stands for, never been well since. And we often overlook this, but it's such a key clinical indicator. So a great question is just to start, like, when was the last time you felt well? When was the last time? And let's say, oh, I've always felt bad. Oh, okay. Did you feel bad like this when you were two? Well, no, not when I was two. Okay. How about when you were in kindergarten? I always try and tie it to a point of time. They can go, oh, yeah, and they'll flash back and remember, oh, when I was kindergarten, no, it's fine. Okay. How about when you were in fifth or sixth grade? Oh, no, I was fine. Okay. How about like high school? I was fine. Okay. How about like when you graduated high school, did you go to college? Oh, yeah, I started kind of feeling bad in college. Okay, now we're on to something, right? Now they'll say, I don't know if you just ask them the question, but now we're starting to have a conversation. So then I'll continue that and say, okay, well, what happened around that time? What were you doing? Oh, well, you know, it was really, really stressful. And I was away from home for the first time and I had a bad situation with a boyfriend. There was some abuse, blah, blah, blah. Now they're talking to you and now you're writing like crazy, trying to get all of this information down. So when you kind of go down these little, you're going to find, you're going to get all these little rabbit trails you're going to go on, right? So when you ask them, when was the last time you felt well? That is going to open up a whole world, a whole line of questioning that's going to go in a hundred different directions. And you're going to be able to get a lot of clues about what might be going on because it's so easy to chase a symptom. We do it without even thinking. I do it. I'm guilty of it. And I know better. But we chase a symptom and the patient comes in like, oh, well, my feet hurt. Okay. Well, why do your feet hurt? Well, you know, I've got arthritis. Oh, okay. Well, let's see if we can fix your arth- Stop. When did that happen? What happened? When did it happen? What was your history like? We have to dig a little bit deeper. Some of the other questions that you can ask are, you know, if they can't really articulate when they started feeling bad, often it's related to travel out of the country. So you may want to remind them about that. So in my example, I might say, if you were in college, did you go out of the country? Oh, yeah, we went on a missions trip. Oh, and I was really sick when I got there and I was on antibiotics and blah, 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 blah. And you're like, okay, now I got it. Now you know that that NBWS moment is probably tied to some kind of a parasitic issue or infection or something like that. You can also ask about like their physical location. Sometimes if you can tie it back to like, what house did you live in? 
Or what city did you live in? Or what car did you drive? Or what job did you work at? Sometimes memory will come back if you can give a prompt about a specific location, you know, a point in time. You also might ask about like emotional trauma. I have one patient that I'm working with right now that had a severely emotionally traumatic experience with someone that she was just dating. That person ended up having a horrible accident and there was literally no one to care for him. And so she was the new girlfriend of three or four months and she ended up, you know, just because she couldn't walk out on him, you know, she ended up caring for him. And it was really traumatic. She lost her job. She lost her friends. Like, it was really traumatic for her. And she's recovering from that. But had I not gone down this line of questioning, I would have never realized it. You know, the question is, was there a significant life event or emotional trauma that may have occurred, you know, 12 months prior or six months prior to the onset of these symptoms? And then I always ask them about infections, you know. How about like, were you in the hospital as a child? What your antibiotic history, that kind of thing. And that actually leads me to number two. Those are digestive illnesses. And I'm more looking for things like stomach flu, food poisoning. Again, did you travel out of the country? Do you feel bloated? You know, are there foods that you're sensitive to? How's your elimination? What's your history of antibiotic use? You know, did your mom have any digestive issues? Did she have any yeast fungal issues? when she was carrying you, you know, those kinds of questions. So I think digestive questioning, I think you guys got that. Like, I'm not worried about you there. You can kind of go down those rabbit holes. That one's a pretty easy one. So that's number two. Number one, NBWS. What was a never been well since moment? That's going to give you the gold. Number two, digestive illnesses. Number three is dental health. Don't forget about dental health. This one is often overlooked. We don't ask them questions about their dental health because the number one question, you can guess what I'm going to say. Have you had a root canal? (laughs) That's the number one thing. And tell me about your teeth cleanings. How often do you go? If they've had to have a deep cleaning because there's so much going on in the mouth that they've had to go do the deeper cleaning where they, you know, it's a little bit more harsh and severe, that tells you a lot. The mouth is the gateway to the digestive tract. What happens in the mouth is affecting and influencing and reflecting what's going on downstream. So I do love asking about their dental health. So root canals are a big deal. They'll usually know when they've had to have a root canal, but they often don't know about cavities. And if cavities, crowns, fillings, et cetera, I want to know whether those fillings are amalgam fillings. What did they put in the mouth? I had a patient years ago that had three different types of metal fillings in his mouth and he could not figure out why he kept having headaches and like these like seizure like things and they couldn't figure it out. And I said, well, it's probably because you have all this arcing going on in your mouth. And sure enough, once he had the two fillings removed and they were all the same, he had them replaced, they were all the same metal, all of those symptoms went away because the arcing had stopped. So you want to ask them what kinds of fillings. Now, When I married my husband, I said to him one day, we were actually out taking a walk, and I said, do you have dental fillings? He goes, oh, yeah, my mouth, we are just a dental family. I said, what does that mean? He said, oh, we all get cavities and all kinds of stuff. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. I said, well, what kind of fillings? I don't know. You know, if I look in my mouth, they're just all white. And I said, let me see. And he opened his mouth, and I looked inside, and he had a mouth full of crowns on his back teeth. But some of them were kind of a gray color. I thought, dang it anyway. What they did was they left the amalgam filling in there and just put a crown over the top of that bad boy. And I said, you've got some mercury in there. Oh, no, 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 no. My dentist said they got it all out. I said, okay, whatever. So sure enough, the next time he went to the dentist, I said, would you do me a favor? Just ask them. Just say, hey, you know, can I see my x-rays? And I said, if you have any fillings in there, then they're going to light up. You're going to be able to see them on an x-ray. And he brings me back the x-rays. He knew the dentist well. He brings me back the x-rays and the dentist goes, oh, yeah, all of yours are mercury. I said, see, just because you don't have silver when you open your mouth doesn't mean that they didn't cover it up. And it wasn't, you know, nobody's trying to do anything bad. That's just what they're trained to do. So you want to ask those questions and don't be afraid to look in their mouth. Just say, let me see, you know, take a peek in there. So you want to ask about root canals, crowns, cavities, extractions. Have they had any teeth extracted? Do they have any dental appliances? 
What about bleeding gums? That's another one that's huge. When you get bleeding gums, we know we've got some capillary fragility. That can be a problem in the endothelium. It can be a problem elsewhere in the body. So dental health is a big one. And then also stress. Stress is number four. So you want to ask about their stress. Now, when you talk to like an A-type patient, that would be me. We will deny and deny and deny all day long how much stress we're under. We'll say it like, yeah, I got a lot of stress, but I'm good. I'm good. Your A-type patients, they are always sicker. I know I'm telling on myself. They are always in worse shape than they believe or that they lead you to believe. Does that make sense? They're always worse. So the things that you're going to want to ask that are going to maybe give you a little bit more idea about their ability to stress handle and or how stress has influenced them is to ask them about their childhood. You know, what kind of home did you live in? Were you in an alcoholic home with an alcoholic parent? Was it an abusive home? You know, emotionally abusive. Hopefully it's not physical abusive, but was there any kind of abuse going on? And I don't usually lead with this conversation because what I want to do is I want to build connection with the patient. You know, I want to build some relationship with them. I want them to feel like I got them. They can trust me and we're working together on this. So if you lead with this stress question, sometimes that doesn't work out very well because they're nervous to tell you anything personal. So I always ask about the kind of home, what kind of upbringing were they in? And I always ask about their school history. You know, were you bullied? Were you the popular kid? Were you the unpopular kid? You know, tell me about going to school. What was that like? And they'll say, oh, you know, my dad was in the military. And that always says a lot. And then we moved, you know, every nine months. So I was in, you know, 37 schools in 12 years or whatever. Like they'll tell you that story. That's huge amount of stress. There's no social support. There's no friendship support. They're always in a new place. They're probably always being picked on. There's probably a lot of loneliness and a lot of, you know, negative self-talk going on. Also, I will ask them about their current stress load, you know, on a one to 10 scale. I sometimes will often ask them about their coffee habits, like how addicted, quote, are you to coffee? Do you need coffee to get your engine up and going in the morning? Well, coffee just fuels adrenaline. And so they're living off of the adrenaline, basically, not eating. And coffee is an appetite suppressant, so then they're not eating well. So you've got that going on. Also, like unexplained weight gain unexplained weight gain. That can also be adrenal stress type issue as well. And then, you know, sometimes blood sugar, because if they're under stress, remember that the adrenal glands are involved along with the liver. And of course, the pancreas, that's kind of the triad. Those three are involved in blood sugar regulation. So if there's a high amount of stress, there may be some stress eating, and they may also have then that secondary weight gain or blood sugar type issues. So, you know, I kind of just ask them, you know, if your house was on fire, what would your response be? And if they say, oh my gosh, I would just totally freak out, they just like would lose it. Then you know that their ability to adapt to general stressors is minimized. So stress is a good line of questioning. And then number five is their mode of delivery. Now, I don't always dive too much into this because it's pretty yes or no type questions. And I do ask this on my intake form. But in the mode of delivery, what I'm really looking for was a C-section or vaginal because that's going to tell me a lot about the foundation of the microbiome. But also I want to know breast or bottle fed. That's going to tell me a lot too because if they're bottle fed, I can guarantee that there was a lot of synthetic nutrients. They were given a lot of sugar and they were not given enough fat. So breast milk is largely fat. So bottle fed babies do not get that fat. So I'm asking about that. I'm asking about any childhood illnesses. So did you have, you know, chicken pox as a kid? Did you have any meningitis? Were you hospitalized for anything? Like one of my daughters was hospitalized briefly for Bell's palsy. It was just an overnight stay or not Bell's palsy, herbs palsy. And that was from birth. And so they kept her and watched her and that kind of thing. But, you know, those are the things you want to ask them about. And it wasn't a big thing and it's not now, but you do want to ask those kinds of questions. And did they have antibiotic use? You know, did you have chronic ear infections? Did you have chronic sinus infections? Did you always have strep throat or tonsillitis or something like that? Did you have some gut issues? Did you have, you know, what else was going on? So that's the fifth line of questioning that I like to ask is mode of delivery and questions kind of about their, you know, childhood, so to speak. So those are my five. Are you ready? We'll go back over them quickly. So NBWS, you want to 
inquire deeply about that never been well since moment. And then we want to look at the health of digestive system, like what are the history of digestive illnesses? And then dental health, of course, want to look in their mouth, like get up close and personal. If you can get a copy of their dental records, great. There's also, you know, you can find them and you probably all have this, but there's the meridian chart as it has to do with the teeth. And that chart is gold because if you can see what teeth have been affected by any kind of cavitation, if there's been a root canal or they've been extracted, you're going to know what meridian has been affected. And it's amazing how often that is absolutely pans out to be true. And I completely believe in that. So you may want to show them. You may want to have one of those tooth meridian charts handy. Just laminate it, have it in your office, have that part of your new patient process, the things that you like check off your list that you go over with every new patient. But you want to like show them like when you have your teeth messed with, this is what's being blocked. This is what could be interfering with what's uh, normal physiology in the body. Then you want to ask about their stress history, their mode of delivery. And then lastly, you know, in the last, I don't know, this is not new news to you, but in the last probably 10 years or so, I've really been asking a lot about body and skincare products. I've been asking a lot because the rate of our toxic exposure is so high. It is so, so high, whether it's food and toxins on food. Well, that's another thing, you know, you're going to be getting a diet history from them. That kind of goes with the digestive piece. But whether it's food, cleaning products, carpet, like now we know that a lot of the popular, what I'll say, exercise wear, like Lululemon, they just got ratted out for having cancer-causing chemicals in their garments, in their pants, their workup pants. So, you know, it's just everywhere. So the things that the patient can identify with and kind of wrap their head around are their skin and body care products, the things that they're putting on their skin. And I have become pretty stern about getting those things out of their lives because that's one thing we can control. I can't control the crap they put in the water. I can't control it when I go to an airport and I'm on the other side of security and the only water there is for me to drink is bottled water. I just have to make the best choice I can. Like, I don't have an option. I don't have a good option. There are some things we can't control. I can't control the air that I breathe, but I can control what I put on my skin. And so I want to make sure that I'm getting good body and skincare products. So shampoo, lotions, face care, skin care, you know, face wash and moisturizers, even makeup and blush and lipstick and all the pretty things that women especially like, and even men, you know, like aftershave lotion and shaving cream and that kind of thing. So there's all of that to deal with. And then kind of an extension of that would be things that are like the cleaning products, dishwasher soap, you know, dishwasher soap leaves a toxic film on your dishes. So I've been making my own dishwasher soap and they're super, super easy, really, really easy to do. And I love doing that because that's just one way. So if you can create the recipe, in fact, if you will send me an email, support at rondanelson.com, I will send you my dishwasher soap and my laundry soap recipe. And I recently sent this out to the attendees at the seminar that I taught in Iowa, the in-person seminar. But I've since kind of tweaked up my dishwasher soap recipe. So if you have that one, let me know and I'll send you the new one. But yeah, I'll send them to you. If you just email me, I'm happy to send them to you. Support at RhondaNelson.com. And it's Rhonda with no H, R-O-N-D-A. But, you know, those are the little things that they can actually do that really do make a big difference for them in their health. And they feel empowered, right? They're not relying on you to give them a whole bunch of pills and supplements and a liver detox and all the things. But these are little things that they can do. You know, make a list of the body care products that you recommend. One of my favorite lines now, I'm telling you, is Epions. I love this skincare line. And having a med spa, you know, I own a med spa as well. That is one of the skincare lines that I absolutely love. And it works because it heals the skin barrier, the dermis, the epidermis. It gives it the nutrients that the skin needs to be healthy without all the other chemicals and crap that they put in most skincare. So I'm a big fan of them. If you want more information, you can ask me about that too. So my staff's going to kill me when they hear this podcast recording. They're like, you gave out that email? Yes, I did, because I really want to help you. So there you go. Those are my five questions plus one bonus question about body and skincare products and household products. 
that you can really use when you're working with patients to help find out what's really happening, what's going on behind the scenes. And all of these questions in a new patient intake should take you maybe 20 minutes or so, 20, 25 minutes. So even if you've got the new patient paperwork, they've filled it all out, note where you have some additional questions, like where are your red flags? You go, mm, that answer doesn't make sense. You know what I'm talking about. Like you read something and they'll tell you one answer in one part of the intake form, and then you have kind of a different answer in a different part of the intake form. Like something not matching up here, what's going on? So you're going to know what kinds of questions you're going to ask them, but that's what I would do. I would really be intentional and type some of these questions out. You know, if you need to re-listen to the podcast, do that. Write some of these questions out, the ones that kind of stick out for you, and just kind of go over them in your new patient intake during your visit with the patient the first time. And it doesn't even hurt to revisit them later because sometimes things change and, you know, as they get better, they'll remember things and they'll give you little pieces of the puzzle that, you know, you may have not gotten the privilege of hearing the first time around. So there you go, friend. That's what I've got for you this week. My five plus one line of questioning that you can use when you are working with a brand new patient to give you a lot better insight about what's going on with them, what the underlying cause might be, and that gives you the tools to be able to help them get better faster. So there you go, friends. Take care. I hope you have an amazing week. I'm always here for you. As you know, I just gave you the bat email, right? Support at rondanelson.com. So you can email, ask for those resources, and we're happy to give them to you. And if you are not in the Clinical Academy, you are welcome to join. I'd love to have you there. That's where I give you all, and I mean all, of the clinical protocols, details, training that you ever would need to be a rock star clinician. It's an amazing community and such good knowledge. It's 20 plus years of my clinical experience all wrapped up into one little tiny inexpensive membership. It's genius. Anyway, hope to see you there. Otherwise, see you next week on the podcast.